Welcome everyone. Welcome to this evening of Nature Talk 6, which um, for us, it's a whole series that we've accomplished in the last six months, really. Um, we've been putting an effort to do one each month, finding beautiful speakers and people around the world that bring a voice for nature. And uh, in tonight's episode, where the, the reasons we have set up Nature Talks is for bringing inspiring voices and speakers, giving them a platform for a powerful voice for nature and the earth at this time as we as the, we're moving into new times with the earth. And so I'm one of the directors of Fellowship of the Trees. I um, we started uh, Nature to um, Nature Talk six months ago, but we started Fellowship of the Trees two years ago as a um, grassroots community interest company and um, not for profit. And our whole aim of Fellowship of the Trees was to reconnect people to the earth with intention and a prayer and ceremony. And we started doing um, our first projects were planting trees in ceremony, which which um, we had such a big take up of people and people loved coming together and doing that. And um, so we we kept on doing that. And then the um, um, pan or pandemic hit and that sort of stopped us in our tracks a bit, but we kept on going and we started up um, nature talks we started up um, tree guardians which was um, seeds to um, saplings um, that's gone to a bit of sleep at the moment because as you know a seed to a sapling takes a while to grow especially with native trees and we've got our community tree nursery um, nursery collaborative which is a big um, uh, part of our projects at the moment too and that also, we have a uh, talk next week on the 25th for um, getting down to the bare roots, if you're interested in that. So tonight's talk is um, really about Hans and his beautiful contributions that he's, he's uh, contributing to the earth. And, you know, stepping out of our comfort zones um, each and every day to do something we love, something from our heart, something that we believe in and something that we do from our heart to take something. And I believe that Hans does that each and every day with all his um, massive contributions. I met Hans through some friends, uh, Patricia and um, Debbie, through a group called World, um, World Adventures in Wellbeing. And I went and they introduced me to this community, um, holistic living community. And I, I started going to the calls cause I felt called to beautiful communities and, and cause it's something that I've been traveling around the earth to see. And these also the um, United Kingdom to see different communities and how they work with nature and the people. And one of the things that um, really struck me with Hans is he's what he's up to. He's, you know, founding the holistic, uh, one of the founders of holistic community and university. And the um, when I met him on that weekend, I was blown away by all these, you know, all all the geniuses of his mind and what he's contributed through his biodynamic um, agriculture, farming and nutrition and promoting food health so and um with with speaking with Hans I was I was thinking oh he'd be someone really great to bring on board and so it's a personal honor for me to have you on tonight Hans so thank you and uh, just bear with me too because I'll get a little bit emotional because <laughs> I've got a cold as well so I'm <laughs> my voice might go eh, eh, and I might feel I sometimes I feel so much joy my voice also goes eh, eh. so <laughs> it's fair with me that happens as well and um you know one of the reasons I also do this work I um I'm a um a universal laws and nature laws coach and I love helping people bring their heart's desires into being and finding what their heart's desires so these this project of nature talks 
really when we came up with it with the other directors we thought it it really struck a chord in my heart so again really welcome you all here tonight it's an honor to have you all to share the evening with you all and um if you have any questions during the evening we're going to open the room up in an hour um about um eight o'clock and you can personally ask hans questions and or write them in the chat box and if you're on facebook live you can write them in the um, messages and we'll bring them through to the room so hans would you like to share anything before we move on to the questions <laughs> well first of all a big thank you and a hug and uh <laughs> blessings on everybody who made it to this um, meeting tonight giving up their evening and um tuning in um feeling very honored to be on your platform nature talks and um you know thumbs up to your efforts also with the tree work because uh that really takes a lot of foresight and a lot of um selflessness because as uh, i can't remember who said it uh, there's nothing like planting a tree in which shadow you never will sit yourself and as you just pointed out uh, this is something where traditionally folks were actually planning 600 years ahead. So foresters of Central Europe were having 600 years in mind. And there's the old tradition of uh, when, a, when a girl was born, they would plant an, an hectare of woodland. So they had uh, an endowment for the wedding and they could then use the timber to build, you know, all the structures that were needed for the new farm and the family and the extended family that grew around it. So I love your vision of supporting that future of the landscape that it regenerates in terms of safety and security of having clean water again, uh, of creating safe havens for the wildlife, and also your passion, you know, to bring communities together, because there's nothing like having people also honoring the forest and the new plantings by giving their input in terms of their own cultural and artistic capacities that we can give to nature and all the invisible beings that are helping to grow all those beautiful trees. So I'm honored and I feel very happy to be here and uh, can't wait to get into interaction with everybody with your questions and your, um, yeah, your precious thoughts and initiatives you have in your heart. Mm, thank you, Hans. That's really beautiful. Really, really inspiring. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the next question, um, I guess, which is going to be directed at Hans. And can you tell us more about what causes you are currently um, engaged in and working with at the moment? All right. Um, well, most of the day, I seem to be busy on, on the screen here, meeting with people. And luckily, we just had a, a beautiful weekend in Devon where we are engaging in preparing to buy a property which we actually blessed and when i say we blessed it um, for those who are not familiar with biodynamic agriculture we have certain preparations that are alchemical substances that we create uh, over a period of half a year or more so we can actually regenerate the soil and also recognize what lives in the land as the invisible beings that we need to nourish and also direct in our work with nature. So my main engagement right now is to foster the creation of holistic living communities, which holistic W H O L I S T I C meaning the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And unfortunately, particularly in the English speaking world, and through the materialistic science that has been um, furthered and promoted here in England through natural science, every department of life, every discipline has been separated. And reductionist thinking has created a destruction in all our spheres of life, be it health, be it environment, economy, social life, what have you. So I'm feeling an impulse being here in England, recognizing the deep seeded um, connection that people generally have to nature, their, their love for nature, their caring for nature, the, the protective spirit that lives here in England and the British Isles, or as they used to be called Albion, the Isles of Albion and Avalon. 
there is a deep-seated longing in every human being and i believe any of you have that also noticed as you you know join this meeting i i trust you have that recognition and that consciousness that we need to regenerate the connectivity between all the different spheres of life and that's my mission at this moment at this time of my life having been a integrated rural development worker and humanitarian aid worker for over 30 or even 40 years and training development workers worldwide in six countries and two continents, wow. it's come to my attention that we have to start here in, in Britain on this beautiful island, this green island, where over 300 years, people have gathered knowledge, have gathered consciousness, have gathered trees. Like when you think of all the riches of trees that you're having, uh, you don't have that in Germany as much as here. England is the richest country in terms of cultural acquisition. The problem I see is Britain, particularly the ruling class, has not learned to share it with other countries and give it back. And so all my work that I did over the years and decades in rural development was always, and this is my main mission now, to help people to connect back to their land connect back to their ancestry, connect with their inner dignity and sovereignty of being able to embrace any activity that we think we can do, we can will it, we can do it. And we can learn anything if we have the mind to open our mind. And so my vision is, and, and the mission that I'm here for now is to create a life school where we embrace all the disciplines of life be it the work with the land, be it the work with medicine and integrative medicine, particularly holistic medicine, functional medicine, be it education and having all these different areas of life that we embrace grow from the soil up because we don't realize how estranged we are from our soil, from our land, from our mother. So I believe here it's motherland. I don't know. In my country, it's the fatherland, uh, depending where you grew up. But it's, it's, your, it's your ancestry. Your ancestors are buried in your soil. And the wisdom and the spiritual work they did is in the soil. And it nourishes us. It nourishes our spirit. It nourishes our dignity. It nourishes also partly our pride and our motivation to do something about it when we are inspired by this. And so I uh, feel very strongly connecting with this one area in Devon, which is a very special area in itself in terms of its cultural and artistic expression and all the different projects that are there already that we want to affiliate with and create a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary community that will not just be there for itself and the land that we're on, but it will open up possibilities to teach others through immersion workshops to learn about an integrated lifestyle where we can learn every aspect of life again. So we get away from specialization and expertise to integrative way of living where we can support each other in that multifaceted way. And also beyond the community, uh, create a renewal in the economic life for the wider community. So the involvement of a wider community and looking at work towards leaving the, the known system, which we know as the legal system or statute law, and move into common natural and equity law, universal law, God's law, or the goddess's law, um, Sophia law, uh, the wisdom of the universe, and work directly through that authority, through each one of ourselves as sovereigns to manifest ourselves in our vocation, in our mission, each one, and my mission at this moment is to help each one that comes in contact with us as a community to help to empower you to find that version of yourself that is the highest principle that you came here for to manifest on this earth in your life now. No. Too many people have opted out already and have chosen the way out. And, you know, just listening to Zach Bush recently also, uh, when you hear doctors speaking, they realize now that illness is actually a cheap excuse for a way out of this life because we don't want to embrace our full responsible life. So that's my main cause, my main mission, my main work at this moment, besides running a, a international online biodynamic uh, gardening course, Grow Your Own Health, because I believe very much that 
each one of us needs to take back responsibility for our own health, for the food that we need. That's not just food secure, locally sourced, but also qualitatively very high quality and nourishing, and that it's done communally. I think the biggest demise that we're experiencing, particularly in these last two years, is the lack of the opportunity for people coming together on the land and also in other communal activities through the arts, the crafts, the artisanship, through dance, through whatever expression that might be to enjoy life again. So I think all of it needs to lead towards joy. It needs to lead towards celebration. It needs to lead towards the recognition that we need to do the work to fulfill each other's basic human needs, which is not just physical needs, but also emotional, uh, spiritual, cultural needs, and then celebrate and also help people to go through the rites of passage. We've lost that intimate relationship to the rhythms of nature and the rhythm to our own life passages uh, from birth or conception even, or preconception, right through the different uh, relationships that we're creating with each other um, between individuals or the family that's growing and the children that are coming into life and themselves growing up. And then right over to the point where we're transitioning into the, the biggest expanse of life that we can experience, which is what we call death, but really it's a new birth. So we're gonna embrace in our communities all the spectrum of all the different areas through people who are uh, or were experts in their previous professional life, but have now opened up to work holistically as a team, integrate it and explore those different facets of life. Wow, Hans. Wow, there's so much in that. The, the rhythms of our life and our ancestry in the soils. Wow, that's just moved me so much. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Can you, um, with the with the rhythms of our life and our ancestry in the soils, could you speak into that a bit, like what that actually feels like to work together like that from that, that ancient, the ancient understanding? Yeah. I'm starting with the, the nature cycles, which being a gardener and having done a lot of project, project work with establishing community gardens, community supported agriculture projects. The, the essence of community and the connection with land that was most nourishing for me in my own experience was when we celebrated the seasonal changes and the festivals. And that might be, you know, Christian festivals, Jewish fest, fest, festivals, uh, Islamic festivals. We really want to bring the different religious aspects into this and the possibility to honor each other in our own faith and interfaith, but also these uh, turning points. When we think of the, the two crosses that we have in the year, the spring equinox, autumn equinox, the solstice, winter and summer, which were all points of initiation in the old Druidic and Celtic tradition here in, in these isles and also all over Europe. And then we have even more pertinent ones, which are the diagonal crossing points, which I won't remember all the Celtic names for it, but we, you know, we have Imbo coming up and then we have um, Beltane and San Wine and Halloween is the modern name for the autumn one, which are actually the, 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 the crossing points from the winter energy into the spring energy, et cetera, you know, the, the, the spring into the summer energy with the vitality. And if we celebrate those in a, with a new consciousness, what I'm experiencing is um, these vernal points and also vitality changing points, we then can inwardly also take responsibility for our inner changing relationship to nature and to the cosmos, because this is directed by the sun and the sun is bringing in the cosmic rays that the sun is only a concentrator. It's, it's not a, it's not a nuclear reactor in my belief. It's actually concentrating all the light that comes from the cosmos. It's differentiating it into the planetary spheres which are moving, constantly changing, which is our soul sphere and which is our, the harmonies of the spheres. And we take up at these points in time, very special energies to transition into these, these new periods. And it's a joy to do that and you know, celebrate with dance, with, with food, with uh, ceremony for nature, 
and these blessings that we're doing uh, for nature with the preparations and other uh, blessings of substances, with our own prayers, with our invocations, um, we can come into nature. And then in terms of the, the ancestors, and I don't want to jump your questions, but you know, my ancestors coming partly from Germany and Hungary many centuries ago, and probably even further back Mongolia, for me, it was very hard to find an identity in Germany where I was born. And my first identity fell with the English language for some reason. And I thought I would end up in the States, but that was a karmic kind of longing that I had that maybe it, we can go into that at some point. But I ended up in England and I felt trapped in England, in this island. I was gonna come here for two years, become a Waldorf teacher, Steiner teacher. And then I discovered this amazing program and learned how to do integrative rural development and learned all the different facets of life. And I realized that I'm feeling connected to this ancestry of this land for some reason. I don't know what connects me with this. There's such wisdom in this land. There's such beauty in this land. There's such nourishment in this land that whoever lived here before, and I've just watched the series about King Alfred, 870, and the unifying, and it gives me goosebumps talking about this, the unification of the Viking spirit, the Danes and the Anglo-Saxons, living in peace, united, one on the land, being commoners of the land, and there was only one crown, but there was no ruler, literally. The ruler was there to protect the people to have the right over their land again. That was 870. And at those times, people lived in peace, once the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons made peace until William the Conqueror uh, created, created havoc again. That's when the constitution of England started. And I think that history, that deep embedded history that's in the land through the suffering and the, the fighting of people for the freedom, I think I can feel that. It's like, it gives me so much energy, so much passion, so much power. Uh, I wanna just you know overflow with it. <laughs> and I don't have that in Germany. I didn't have that in any other country I lived, you know, and I lived in many countries. Wow, Hans, that's just really, I can feel your, your passion. That's so beautiful. And I, and I totally agree. These lands here, I grew up in Australia. These lands here have a magic in the soils. It's, I can never really speak it, but I can feel it in, in the stones, in the soils, in the lands, in the trees. That's what brought me to create um, with these other directors, uh, Fellowship of the Trees, because I've always felt a place in, in this land so deep and so, so nourishing. And it comes, it, it has so many stories and uh, to share with people that are willing to listen. So thank you, that's beautiful. And where, um, where the next question I'd like to talk about more is biodynamics and how did that start for you? Okay. I think it started for me roaming in the forests outside the suburb where I grew up and well actually started even earlier uh, playing on the fruit trees. Um, my parents who were refugees they had a, a room in a cellar in a house on a, on a hillside, very much like the land I'm looking at now creating houses there, very similar and uh, being brought up in parks, you know, having this relationship to nature that has been cultured by humans, when we think of the fruit trees or the parklands and the ornamental uh, landscape. And then I was transposed to, when I was six, to an area where the city of Stuttgart had its nursery for all the, the city gardens. And, you know, it was like a big field, a green field. And the first building was a four rise blo uh, block where I lived on, on the top in the fourth floor under the roof. And everything was green. There were no roads. There was just mud everywhere. And you had to walk to the next village, which was six kilometers away, four miles. And I remember this very vividly, how around me uh, a suburb grew with 16,000 inhabitants, but designed by Le Corbusier, who was a very renowned uh, Swiss-French architect, who said, we're going to create green space between the buildings. We, we build high and create green space. And I was very inspired by this, you know, the landscaping that happened, you know, through the mud and through the destruction. 
And I became a landscaper later in my life, funnily enough. So this influence of seeing landscape being cultured and changed and, you know, made into something that's humanized, I, I call it, because I don't believe nature evolving on its own. I don't think nature on its own is going to ever solve its own problems because we as humans are part of the natural development, all the higher beings that are around us, we have to uh, be responsibly interfacing with it. So I think that inspired me initially to, to relate to the land in a way that I, I was totally, totally immersed you know, in the woodlands and playing with the brooks and everything. And then when I was 20 and came back from the army, it was compulsory service in Germany, I had house plants. And for some reason, when I started studying and found out about Waldorf education at Emerson College in England, I realized I had to come to England. My house plants were suffering and I had a lot of meetings with the biodynamic farmers here. You know, what do I do with my plants that they're growing better? And then I saw the planting calendar and I, I saw they're, play, they're working by the moon. It was all new to me. I was a city boy. Even though I was in nature, I was a city boy. I had no idea. I didn't know the trees had flowers and had seeds. Wow. I had no idea about anything. And so I got my first book I got was The Philosophy of Freedom in German. And I got the first book, which was the biodynamic agricultural book that was written by three doctor scientists of agriculture. And I was so inspired by reading. It was like, I come back to England and study here at Emerson College in Sussex. I don't know if anybody knows about Emerson College. It's an anthroposophical adult training center, education center. And it became my spiritual mother. It was my second birth, my spiritual birth and my, my soul birth to fully express myself because before I was really hemmed in in Germany. It was like being in a prison, you know, in a square box and don't get outside because um, you become persecuted. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. And, and that's where your journey started with biodynamics and through the learning there. How long ago was that? So that was 43 years ago. Wow. Makes me ancient. <laughs> it, make, it makes you a master. <laughs> but not obsolete. <laughs> a lot of wisdom to share. A lot of wisdom to share, Hans. Well, a lot of journeying that happened on, you know, on the service through the different countries and meeting people on the land. And as Rudolf Steiner said, he didn't want to write a philosophy of freedom. He wanted to write a philosophy of the wisdom of the farmers because the, the most wise people are the farming community and i was blessed by meeting hundreds and thousands of farmers in my journey and work in the field helping farmers to convert to a, a more productive i could say you know a method of growing food because traditional methods are not always the most effective so we need to bring the traditional together with the science with the biodynamic impulse in terms of spiritual science that steiner brought to biodynamics and also the latest scientific research and our artistic capacity to then unite it on a piece of land and create a unique expression of that piece of land that it can be enhanced and embellished with our knowledge and the wisdom that we gather from wherever we can gather it from because we are only a conduit. Everything I know right now has come from somewhere else. It's not mine. Mm -hmm. I'm just sharing it. It comes through me. So I want you to recognize, you know, we, we don't own anything. We don't even own our body. We're responsible for it. We're guests here. We're guests on the earth, visitors. But if anybody thinks we could own anything, I think that's a concept. Uh, it's, it's leading down a dead end. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. And I, the next question I want to move through to with that is like, how have the opportunities and how did these opportunities like with the food and land project start for you? Like you've explained. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, um, it's very interesting how you have these people in your life. And I had people in my life, adults that, you know, I looked up to who were maybe, you know, at my age now, a bit younger. And some were quite, quite a bit younger when they were teaching me in school. But if, so the first experience was, and I'm not sure what was first, if it was division, I had to work with Mayan Indians that I had when I was 19. I think the first one was the geography teacher who taught us about the unequal distribution of resources on, on the planet mm. and the robbery that we're committing 
with uh, developing countries and the North-South conflict, which was very rife in the late 70s and early 80s in terms of, you know, the exploitation of oil and, and resources. And I've become very conscious of that. And so that drove me also with my parents losing their land in Hungary when the Soviets took over um, after beating back the, the German soldiers in Budapest. And so my parents became refugees and ended up luckily in Germany, not like my granddad, he ended up in Siberia. Mm -hmm. So the family got split up in that time also. So there's a huge family trauma that I carried within me and try to resolve by doing this development work, this um, humanitarian work for marginalized communities and other refugees that, you know, like in Hartford, Connecticut, I would work with refugees. So this woman and a priest a uh, um, Protestant priest who worked for Dienstein Übersee, which was a development organization in Germany, really inspired me in my 20 and 18 and 19 with a vision. And then at Everson College, I met these two development workers who had worked in Honduras. And I was like, what Honduras? That's the Mayan Indians. That's the native of, of the Mayans. I want to go there. What do I need to do to fulfill my vision that I had when I was 19? And so I started this rural development program. And from there, it's like the rest is history. It's like it opened a whole world to me, which was so unknown that embraced education, social sciences, uh, cultural studies, religious studies. Uh, I said earlier to Nancy, give me a machete and I'll build you a house. Give me a machete, a spoon and an egg, and I'll build you a, a wood stove that uses only a third of the wood that normal wood stoves, that a modern wood stoves would use. And give me, you know, a hoe and I can do your whole garden with a bit of seed that I might get from nature or from other people who are gardeners. So we learned to do everything from scratch because we needed to be starting where the people were, not impose our cultural and technological knowledge on other people. So that's how it started and then it, from there, it just unraveled and, you know, it became richer and richer, the more different cultures I met on the way, uh, both um, in the natural jungle, in the tropics and subtropics, as well as the city jungle and the green belts around cities to protect green belts in economic and um, food crisis in United States, in Hartford, Connecticut, and Spain, Valencia uh, in 2007-8. In the 80s, it was in America, they had a lot of food crisis in the inner city. So I would end up in projects, bringing food into the inner cities, working with refugees and um, halfway house people, orphanages, uh, with street kids, with drug addicts and, and drug dealers. And we'd all bring them to the land together with the multimillionaires and the middle class people. And it all worked together on the land. They would you know, do the festivals together, feast together. And realize we're all humans at the end of the day. We've just ended up in certain social um, stratus that separated us again. So the land, I feel, and particularly when we work with biodynamics and this consciousness of rhythm and the connection with the rhythm of the moon, of the rhythm of the actual planets, the rhythm of the zodiac, the influence from the wider stars, if we have that consciousness and see every human being as a universe, then we have constellations. They're so enriching. We can't even imagine yet the abundance. Wow. <laughs> so beautiful, so powerful, so much beauty that you've done and, and helping all these, 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 you know, these um, marginalized communities or, or communities that people don't even, you know, and just to say, sorry to interrupt here, but when you say marginalized, the millionaires we worked with were sometimes more marginalized in their social and cultural behavior and capacities than the people on the ground who were the street kids, the orphans, who were really in touch with life. Wow. So sometimes you think of marginalized upside down also, because we're all marginalized one way or another if we're stuck in ourselves in our own demise and isolation. Wow, beautiful. That's such a beautiful way to, that's just opened up a hundred things in my mind. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And um, and so you, you mentioned all the projects. So you've worked, you know, you've done projects in the USA, in Spain, where else, are, where, what other? Germany, 
uh, running uh, the, the National Biodynamic uh, Gardening Training for a couple of years. And Wales, I started my first own garden and farm venture there with a community supported venture. Uh, I was in the bus country starting projects there, converting a chicken farm into a mushroom organic farm and a healing center. Um, and then I worked for five, well, eight years in Spain, helping to start biodynamic working groups uh, that would you know, either be um, small scale gardeners, farmers, or big scale exporting crops to Central Europe, Northern Europe, and acquire the Demeter standard, which is the highest food standard. So I worked with all sectors of life really. And also um, blessings to the training I had, I would work with all uh, different organizations. I would work with the grassroots level. We would do occupant, we would occupy land illegally in Spain to grow food because people didn't have enough money to have food. We would work with the politicians of the different parties, uh, whoever, you know, business people for funding. So we learned how to work across the sectors, both in terms of the administrative side and the business side of the world, but also in terms of the society and the socioeconomic stratus that we see, um, you know, so spread and, and divided in the world right now. Wow. I just, I, have my, I don't even know what to say, really. It's just such... Amazing. That's holism. It's, it's what holistic <laughs> means. You know, you, you put the tot, dots together and you have to be versatile, mm. innovative, uh, risk-taking. There's no security in tomorrow. You know, many times I didn't know how I was going to pay my rent or, or get back from a, a meeting. I would lead a meeting, say, a thousand kilometers away. I wouldn't know how to drive back because I didn't have the money. And miracles would happen uh you know the the providence if you really believe in what you do passionately and com and more so compassionately mm. for others miracles happen you know all the time as you were saying earlier and mm. the magic you know of what happens also in terms of nature how it supports you and you you don't know what's coming unless you open your eyes and start smelling and feeling and touching and you know, going out of yourself. When we're in ourselves in the thinking, the world is a catastrophe. Mm. The world is a dangerous place and the mind wants to protect us. But if we get into our senses and go out into the phenomena of life and interaction with our community members, life becomes enriching, you know, discovery and adventure. Wow. I'm going to sit with that for a moment. That is just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> really beautiful i yeah for me adventure on this earth and experiencing it and it's it's beauty is being why i moved around it so much and wanting to see all the cultures and really understand all these beautiful different ways that yeah. people express through their land their food the trees their gardens the way they lived for me this is wow it was really i mean if we imagine that what has been is a remnant of a diversity that we can't even imagine how diverse it was mm. for example in mexico when i lived in mexico i had to learn mayan indian and i could talk with two language groups which is a, like they talk like if we compare it with europe uh spanish and italian yeah and they have 12 language groups like German, you know, like English, like, but Mayan origin. Mm. But there were in Mexico 260 languages spoken. The government and the American influence has reduced that to 60 at this moment. Wow. And they're reducing it through the schooling system to nothing if we're not careful. But having said that, we need to lose what has been to rediscover in consciousness how languages evolve and they evolved around the land. They evolved around the, the influence of the soil that differentiates. If you look at plant growth, it looks very different in a valley or in a mountain region from a plain or a seafront side. And the languages are different, the way people express themselves. They found even birds had different, different dialects in England when they sung. We have to recover that through consciousness now. And in that, will grow our spirit. And we know that we're in the greatest sixth extinction. 
But we know also that after each great extinction and during that time, we were setting up the diversity that's to come. Mm. So if we like a caterpillar and are wailing and mourning and only seeing ourselves dying in the chrysalis, instead of focusing on the butterfly, that's when you think the caterpillar dying, this is what's happening right now with the earth. The old caterpillar, the greedy bastard who eats everything, you know, like the, like the tree cutter ants, they're dying and some ants or some beings will evolve that will nurture nature. Mm. And we are part of this now and we can be witnessing that and in embellishing and fostering it and um, hus husbanding, you know, like a hus animal husbandry yes. and wifing it like in the sense of that's the real meaning of husbandry and wife is to be with things, nurturing them from our female sacred capacity and our male sacred capacity, uniting them and giving this to nature now. And the sun, the old sun has died, so the Mayans say and the Incas, and the new sun is evolving, means the new consciousness and new energy. It's going to be a time of abundance, according to the prophecies. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> so don't focus on the crisis. Uh, in the Chinese symbolism, crisis is, is both um, the, the demise of the fall of the, you know, the, the, the problems that are arising, but also the opportunity. Mm, you always see that it's containing both. Beautiful. That's really because the next question I was going to move to, but I think you sort of answered that in a way, but we can see how we can move and bounce with that with with the culture and, you know, land and food. You know, you've spoke about what I, my question was going to be around culture and land and food, but I think you've really sort of spoken into that really. Well, I'd love to elucidate something around that question that you have there, which is the fact that traditional cultures had such a close-knit social life mm. because we're finding out now through science that they lived from the same food, they ate the same food, they shared the same dances, they shared the same language or dialect in their tribes, they shared the same air, everything. Now is a different time. We need to realize that we need to actually come back to the land and eat maybe 80% of the food from that land we're living on. Mm. And 80% of the food, share it in the community. So we develop the this, this similar gut bacteria because mm. what they're finding now is the gut bacteria is informing our mindset and our ideas and our behaviors socially. And they're finding that both on the social relationships that people eat together, they're socially more harmonious, living more harmoniously together. People who eat together from the same bowl and sharing their biome, skin, gut, mouth, everything, have a stronger immune system. Wow. And the more children are in the family, the higher the immune system. So that's one aspect. We need to get back to the locality. But if we isolate ourselves, like in the past cultures used to do in our locality, the consciousness is not going to become a world consciousness. Mm. The 20% of everything we do, everybody we meet, the languages we talk, the languages we think and feel, would be good to do 20% of that every day in a foreign language, in a foreign, you know, eat foreign food. But the mainstay needs to be 80, like they say, you know, concentrate on 80% positive outcomes and positive work that you're doing on what you want to manifest and focus 20% on investigating the challenges and the obstacles to then be able to find the solutions. Beautiful. So the 80 20 rule applies actually to every area of life in, in general. And then if you have that positive outlook, you're going to be very successful. So this coming together locally, mm. like, you know, in the 80s, they said, uh, think globally, act locally. Yes. That's <laughs> the big slogan, ecological <laughs> slogan. But now it's like, act globally also, because we are responsible for what's happening overseas with the resources. If we have one type of technology and, and burn one fossil fuel, mm. it affects indigenous people being, you know, chased off their land or being even murdered because they want the access to those resources. 
I was very privileged that I worked with the Zabatistas for three years in Mexico. They reclaimed two million hectares of their land. Wow. We covered their oil wells, their uh, uranium uh, resources, their potassium and phosphorus resources, but they don't touch it because they know it's part of the earth. We don't need to touch it. They're practicing natural organic agriculture, uh, integrative health care, alternative education, and they have their own government. They're self-governing outside the jurisdiction of the Mexican government. Mm. And that's what I think we're looking for now to create here, free states where we are sovereign, where we can self-govern and be on autonomous, where we can create that identity for our children particularly. I think this is something we are forgetting is mm. the children are totally lost mm. in this modern world of all possibilities. We need to hone it down for the younger children, particularly in the age uh, from birth to five years, that they're in a safe environment, they can touch everything they want to touch. There's no no saying or naysaying because naysaying kills the spirit. Mm. So educationally, we have to create safe environments, natural environments with as little or no machinery where the children can be totally involved in the process that the adults are examples of a safe, uh, abundant, and a caring way of working with nature and with the land and with each other. And then as they evolve, we can have other communities where they as adolescents go, for example, be with their masters and learn more about the modern way of life and evolve into the modern society. But we need to really recognize those stages in life. And, you know, out of that new community, consciousness will grow and new safe uh, feeling of creating safe havens and people living together securely. Wow. That's, you know, that's an amazing future vision. You're obviously a, a visionary in many ways, as well as many other things. Because <laughs> um, speaking of these holistic communities, and you, you, you do the holistic community, founder of the holistic living community, and university, what do they represent in like you were just speaking into that, but if you could speak into what that represents? Well, I would say in a nutshell, it really puts all the dots together. You know, we, we become, okay, I'll, I'll say it this way. If we don't know any of the processes from, for example, putting the seed in the ground, to how you nurture the seed and how you allow it to grow also, because sometimes you have to step back in this rhythm of expression of life. And then the, the cotyledons come up and then the plants come up. And then possibly you have this beautiful vegetable that you want to eat, but then it's not finished. Then you have to know when do you best harvest this vegetable after all the caring, nurturing that you do on the way because it's months of caring and nurturing you need to give as a gardener, then you have this vegetable ready to harvest and to eat, but maybe not to eat because you harvest it. And then the question is, how do you transform that vegetable into something that raises your consciousness to a higher level? That's for me a question. How do you release from that vegetable the harmonies of the spheres, the resonance that they've taken up, with the music that comes in, mm -hmm. which we know the great composers always were able to hear, how do you transform the light that comes from the immense spectrum of universe through that one lettuce that you have in front of you? Are you gonna eat it raw, which will create one consciousness and one way of you relating to the nature around you, being more at one with nature, more open and less enclosed in yourself? Do you steam that lettuce because you may be ill and you can't digest it? Do you cook the lettuce? And once you cook it, then you start creating a consciousness that isolates yourself from that. So we're looking at every life process from its inception. And then we have to go from seed back to seed to seed to seed. And somewhere we'll get lost, but as far back as possible to raise our consciousness and our responsibility to the extent that through that, we become free. Mm. So if we don't know those processes, we're not free. We're dependent. And we know in relationships, dependent relationships don't last, they, go, they don't go well, there's, there's some downfall. 
So we have to do that on every level of life. And the, the best place to start is from the soil and with the plants because they are so forgiving and they're so explicit. And they will teach us in the outside world what's inside because we're sharing a physical body, a life body or biological body like the plants, physical body like the earth and the minerals. And we have a soul body that feels and has emotions that is we share with the animals. And then we have the human consciousness, which is the thinking, which we seem to be the only ones that have it in ourselves. Everything else has it in the cosmos. The thinking is there. And the thinking are frequencies, are mathematical expressions and geometrical expressions, which we captivate in thinking. And then the higher beings who hold that together. And the more we become aware that actually our biodynamic farm or community is connected not just with the social environment and the cultural environment and the earth, but also with the cosmic environment to the source, black, back to the black holes where all the information supposedly comes now from, that is the wisdom of God and of Sophia, then we're exploring to freeing ourselves and widening our horizons to the extent that nobody ever dared thinking of. Mm. I mean, so that, I mean, that horizon is, is infinite. Yep. And we evolve with it. And, and every other being that we nurture and hold in our heart and in our mind and in our activity of giving, you know, supporting them, you know, think of pets. I mean, what a lovely life have they got, you know, we, we provide them food, we, we hug them, we cuddle them, we allow them inside the house. They almost become civilized now. <laughs> um, but just imagine, you know, and we have beings that do the same with us, but hopefully don't spoil us because we need to have that will to evolve ourselves as individuals and then share it with a wider community. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow, that's a really, it's such a beautiful sharing that the way you have has opened all these neurons in my brain going, <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ernst. And I think like, you know, we're coming to the hour. So I'd really yeah. like to open the room up to anyone in the room or if anyone has any questions that they'd like to um ask hans and the room can be open right now so you're welcome to ask any questions to hans i probably have to contemplate a little bit i said so much and might have been confusing or <laughs> taking people on a distant journey i don't know kathy you're on uh we can can't hear you is kathy are you on mute no, I've unmuted. Um, okay, there you are. We got you. Now. I need to get a bit closer. Um, that was absolutely amazing. I feel like um, I've stepped into some known things in a, an abstract way, some ideas, um, but I've, be, I've been taken to this much broader, um, wider place. And I just, I, it was absolutely incredible. I only stumbled across this talk. I don't know how I found it actually, and I'm so pleased I've been here today. Um, there were so many ideas that you were, you, the things you were talking about there, and I can't remember half of them. But what <laughs> I, the question I, I have is, what would you suggest? Um, you know, somebody like me moving forwards to move to move into these these ideas that you've talked about. Now, um, I'm I'm sort of very much involved with green environmental issues um, in my local area and tree planting and things like that. But this idea of, of community and food and soil, I started last year, year before growing a few vegetables in my garden and just being in the soil is the most amazing thing. You know, it's just, I can't even, I, ha I haven't got the words for it. So what would you suggest, um, you know, moving forward? What, what could somebody like me do to move further into this this beautiful place that you you envision for the future yep. starting there wonderful question and thanks for sharing all the wonderful activities that you're committing to nature and your environment already because you must have done a lot of learning on that level 
And for me, the question always arises when somebody asks a question, in which context are you questioning these things? So in terms of the social, economic, cultural, political, and um, you know, converging times that we're in, with your knowledge and with your experience, I would probably add to that question, how could you impact with that, not just yourself, you know, if you're a healthy and vibrant being and you, you have good health, how could you share the knowledge and the wisdom and the experience that you've gained with others? Because what's upon us is the fact that I would dare saying 95% of the population does not know what you might have experienced. And they are hand strapped and um, straightjacketed and handicapped if things were going wrong. For example, if one week there would be no electricity or if you know, there would be a sun flare or there would be a major climate, climatic change, you have skills and mindsets probably developed that other people could benefit from. And I think at this moment, like when I started as a youngster, I was very frustrated and angry when I was 19 at the same time. And I was an athlete and I was a teacher and I was a coach. And, you know, I had a, I had a whole career before I was going to the army at 19. But then I realized that was competitive. I needed to turn all that energy, all that vibrancy that I had inside to share with others. Because only in sharing are we going to enrich humanity and ourselves. You know, as a child, I remember the most happy I was was when I was able to share what I had. And now it's the same, you know, if it's knowledge or whatever it is or goods or, or my house, you know, I share everything because it makes people happy and makes me happy. So I think what's the, you know, for you to question maybe what's the next step for you to expand your knowledge and your own journey in terms of gardening or, you know, uh, taking this to another step and go, how could I share it with others and become an ambassador for what I'm doing so other people will not get stuck in two years with maybe no food. And in that, I hear um, the, the word that springs to mind is community. And I think um, moving forwards, particularly with the way with things that are happening now, community is, is where survival will happen, I think, or where mm. people working together locally. I mean, you, you talked about all of that as well and um, local food and, and people um, just coming together and sharing skills. Um, so yes, thank you for that. And actually, yes, because I tend to keep myself to myself, so I need to stop doing that, and I will. Thank uh, you. There's, there's one aspect that I'm finding. <clears throat> I found that in the Spanish culture and also the British culture, um, people here are very modest, and they don't want to impose, and don't want to, you know, they, they want to leave people the space, but. We had many occasions where people went, came to workshops or things and they, they were like, oh, I learned so much and I'm so enthused, I'm so inspired. I need to share this with others. And the heart starts bubbling over because when we go in the heart, the heart can't stop sharing because it's in constant movement. It's energetically, it's constantly raying out these beautiful energies. The mind is always wondering, am I doing the right thing? Am I imposing on someone else? You know, am, am I uh, capable of doing this? Have I got the capacity? And we question ourselves because the mind wants to keep us where we were. The heart is going to take us into the future. And then when we get into the heart, we get into the will. But the mind is so far away from the feet and the hands. The heart is a bit closer with the circulation of the circulatory system and can get us into the action. So, um, they know also the heart can intuit things where the mind, you know, just can't conceive it yet. So allow yourself, if you can, as a suggestion, to go into that heart space. What, and, and question yourself, you know, what, when you were a child, what, what was really inspiring you? What, what were you really thinking you were going to do with your life? Thank you. 
that was a long time ago but I'll let <laughs> <laughs> that yes thank you that was lovely childhood was a long time ago but um yeah so I'll, I'll have a think on that thank you it's it's time wise a long time away but your child is right here in your heart I had to work hard to rediscover it because, you know, I thought also my childhood is, you know, I, I'm an adult now. I better live up being an adult. But in actual fact, what I didn't realize was that child is my source of energy. That's my inspiration. That's really there in the heart and, and starving for me to open up to it and holding it as, as the adult as I am and allowing it to share with that exuberance that children have, you know. Mm. It's all gone quiet. You're muted, Nancy. I'm just reading the um, Spar and Talk, the resources you would recommend. So he's asking if there's any resources you would recommend to learn more on how to do this, please. He runs community. This is James Cleaver. He runs community tree nurseries and would like to grow healthy and strong trees. So okay, mm -hmm. yeah. There's many courses running in Britain here. Um, I'm not a well. I'm aware of one man who is very uh, knowledgeable and very wise uh, consultant on biodynamic tree management, uh, who's advising huge um, extensors in, in Scotland. He's Scottish himself by birth. And uh, he's, uh, you know, possibly working with people. So I could maybe put someone in touch with him when it's particularly about the more um, intricate parts of how to learn to work with trees. And, you know, I'll just give you one example. Um, we don't realize that trees have a relationship to the planetary movements. And say, for example, oaks have a relationship to Mars. So if you sow an oak seed when Mars is ascending in the zodiac, you're going to have very strong and resilient oaks. If you sow it the other two years of the four-year cycle of Mars, then you have weak oaks. Mm. And the same for coniferous trees, et cetera, where they're relating to Saturn, for example. So in biodynamic farming and gardening and forestry, we know how certain movements of the heavenly body enhance strength, vigor, resilience, pest uh, resistance, uh, the resilience for weather extremes. And then we know how to enhance it with our biodynamic preparations, for example. So uh, if you go on the Biodynamic Agricultural UK website, there are lots of courses that are advertised from which you can choose. In his thank, you, thank you, Hans. You're welcome. That, that's really useful. Um, you mentioned about blessing the soil in this yeah. property you're looking at. I wonder if that's something that you think would benefit the tree nursery. Absolutely. Um, and how, how do you do it? Okay. Um, as it's called a biodynamic preparation, it's quite a process of preparing it. And um, you would need cow manure and cow horns. And then you would work with the capacity of the soil to regenerate itself, forming humus in the autumn and winter, that you put this cow horn with a manure and then you take it out in spring and then you stir it into a barrel with lukewarm rainwater and spray 25 grams, so very little actually, per acre to enhance the soil life, to enhance the rooting of the plants, to enhance the vigor, and also to, for the soil to have more intelligence to regulate itself in terms of the water household and nutrient household. Uh, so it's, it fulfills many functions, just that one preparation we, we blessed the land with uh, this weekend, for example. Wow. And if you don't want to do the process yourself, um, you can buy that preparation straight from the Biodynamic Association in Stroud, where lots of farmers are united to provide the goods, or you go to preparation making weekends or you know on farms and learn how to do it next autumn, uh, because it's done in autumn in September, October. 
So if you were to buy that product now from the, um, yeah. the association, is this the right time of year to apply it? If you were to apply it now, and it's very frosty outside, um, I would probably wait at this moment for your tree nursery until, say, end of February, unless it's really frosty. Um, the best time would be when the soil's waking up. I don't know if you're aware when you go out in the morning and you find you find there's a beautiful smell aroma in the air that mm. is the sense of fertility. You know, the actomycetes are waking up in the soil life. Mm -hmm. That would be the ideal moment. Lovely. Thank you very much. Nice one. Thank you. Let's see. I'm going to see if there's also any anyone else like to ask questions. I'm going to just check on the Facebook group as well. And any live questions that come up with participants here right now? <laughs> Anything that practically, you know, you go, you might be in the city and you just have a terrace or a windowsill. You can practice wonderful growing just in those contexts also and inspire people I, I had a doctor in in uh, richmond and she was uh, treating people in stage four cancer and teaching them how to do juicing and all that and she had only a terrace outside so together with her she, she was in her 80s uh, we established a terrace garden with you know creating wooden boxes and hanging baskets and we grew enough uh, greens and microgreens for her juicing regime that she then you know as you you lead by your example rather than just teaching people how to do it i have wow well, hans thank you we have an, a question here um from shilpa she's asking she's saying thank you for the wonderful talk she came in late but yep. she's asking um uh are there any talks and websites that they she can go to to learn from? Well, in terms of what I've been presenting. Yes, and like right. Friday. Um, and that, yeah. In terms of the community building, we have a regular Friday Zoom gathering from six to seven thirty, which you would be welcome to to join and find out what we're doing. But we're promoting everybody to look at what it takes to grow communities so to speak and all the different aspects that we need to consider and it's a very interesting moment because we're looking very much at the planning process of getting this first community financed and uh, strategizing for the buildings that we want to build even though it has a lot of buildings already and that's on fridays and then uh if you were interested more in the um, growing side of food and so on uh, I'm doing a Tuesday and Thursday evening online, which also uh, opens the possibility for learning opportunities for everybody who's wanting to learn more about growing, uh, where we go through the cycle of the year. And as I said, there are other courses that are also happening in other parts of England uh, in a practical way right now, but also online. So if you go on the Biodynamic Agricultural website of the UK, you see other courses and can compare who you feel drawn to. They've just asked also the links for these website and talks, which Sammy's put um, up on the side for you. Okay. Who, Samuel, who is, um, I've got my two twin sons who would do all the technical support for Fellowship of the Trees and all our talks for the community tree nursery. So they're always in the background holding the space and making sure that everything runs well. There's some information there for Hans on the right hand side or his um, Instagram links and the website. And in that link, the holistic living um, dot co UK, is that the one that they can find out about the community meetings each week on Fridays, Hans? Uh, if you contact me uh, with my email, or send me a text, then that's probably the best way to get in touch with, with me. I check those regularly if you want to get in, in the groove uh, fast enough. Otherwise, Facebook, um, 
also I check here and there, but the best is really to text texting me or emailing me mm -hmm. at this moment. And I'm just looking, going through all the messages here as well. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> just um okay. So what did they ask in space? Have just set up community growing space on the farm for local food resilience. So they're just letting us know what they're doing. Whoops. If there's um we could um whoops, I've just I don't know what I've done now. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. I lost everyone for a moment. Let me go. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, would you like to speak more into um, um, what what sort of um, your in the biodynamics teaching or in the holistic yeah. um, community, or which one feels more important for you to speak into? What what you teach what are the what's the structure in that or in the holistic living what yeah. your what what people are sharing yeah um talking about the growing uh, for example right now we're uh, learning how to get in touch and familiar with our soils because um soils have limiting factors and they have also great potential and then once we have gotten to know our soils and our location, our topography, um, our situation where we are with our garden or even with our flower pots or uh, window boxes or whatever you have that you can also um, get familiarized with in terms of the substrate that you're using. Then how do you ameliorate? How do you improve that? How do you find a remedy to make it better? Because for every situation that you find in life, whatever area of life it concerns or discipline of work, there's always a remedy. If you look you know, beyond even, not just symptoms, but even beyond the cause, because beyond the cause, there's even some higher principle that makes things manifest. So what we're exploring in biodynamics is really to look at the symptoms, to see what's the cause and the context, but then also what's in the invisible, that we can use that from where things manifest. Because if we start talking about elements and the elemental beings and the light information and all those things that we are addressing when we're working with our different substances that we are very specifically knowing how to use, just like a painter. If you use this comparison for a moment, if a painter has a palette of different colors, you have to learn how to use them. And depending what you want to paint, you're going to use them differently. So the same happens in your garden. Your palette is your seeds. It's your weather. It's your uh, microclimate. Also, it's your topography. It's your soil. It's the space weather. It's your own influence. And I think most people forget that we have to also work on ourselves. And that's another thing that we're teaching in the course is, you know, how, what's our own relationship to the garden, to the plants, to nature, to the soil? And how is that impacting it? And how can we actually come into the garden with more of a centered and objective and sometimes a helpful approach? So we're covering both the seasonal changes and you know the different areas of literally like going from soil through the, the plant realm, uh, also looking at the insect world and the, the whole, uh, what people call wildlife, I call it the natural fauna. And then you know, how to integrate all of that. And then how do we start benefiting in terms of the fruits that we gather from that? And what do we do with the fruits that come from the garden uh, in terms of processing transformation that then gives us the most healthy nutrition that we need. So the course is building in that way through the seasons, always working with the seasonal change and then the products that come from the garden or that we put into the garden and preparing you know three to six months ahead doing planning so those are the sort of the structural sides of the course and in terms of the community building it's very much hands-on uh what's in front of us right now which is getting a a, a a a property an estate that is 80 acres um to put a model 
micro dairy and integrated biodynamic farm and vegetable production, fruit production, nut and uh, seed production, and also producing materials for clothing and for uh, building dwellings. And then to create their, the, the necessary financial resources to pay upfront 5 million pounds. Uh, so it's a big project, uh, very ambitious, and it's the pilot project or the archetypical project where people can learn through immersion on the project side to either start their own projects, uh, have sister projects in different countries, and then create confederations with other affiliated communities that are also starting at this moment that we have contact with. It's, it's really amazing how many communities are starting right now that not just eco villages, but they're looking at training people, educating people to multiply communal expression in the natural landscape and also in the cities, because we need to go into the cities and uh, help people to have food security and support with their needs. So those are the subjects we address very much in our community building right now. <laughs> That's huge. I mean, when I came to your, the, you know, that weekend and learned what you're doing and I was listening to the different genius of mine sharing how they're going to make clothes with Pete and how they're going to, you know, how one of the architectures, architects um, creates with, you know, eco homes. And I was just like, this has been an inspiration of mine to do for 25 years. And and it felt like when I came to that event, it just ticked so many of my hearts once. So thank you, Hans, for yep. being such a forefront visionary founder and bringing all that information together and, and sharing it with so many people and people really hearing their hearts being called towards that as well. Thank you. That's huge huge honor thank you thank you a delight it's a <laughs> it's an honor it's a delight and a great pleasure and as i said um just just ask the questions are you know I'll, I'll connect you with the people that you might need um to connect with because of your field of life your interest um we have connections with every profession and every profession actually being very much at the forefront of innovation because we need the forerunners for the new paradigm, not, not going back to the old. There's no back old normal. It's a new normal that we're creating, that we are visioning ourselves and exploring and discovering. So it's very much of a journey of discovery also, which makes it very exciting because you don't know what surprises you around the corner <laughs> that you have to face. Um, Beautiful. Keeps us alive. Beautiful. Does anyone else um, with any questions? Hmm. If not, we got, I think Hans has got a beautiful, oh, what, there's one question here. Hang on. Love to find out about community building event. That, that's the. Right. So. At this moment, it's our Friday meetings, which I can invite Claire to if you leave your email address and we can get hold of that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Would you then, like to do, um, sorry, Hans, go. No, and then further down the line, we will have on, on the ground events that we will also celebrate more, um, hopefully in the near future. And there will be both, um, at other sites, not just in the site which we're going to buy, but uh, here in Sussex, we're going to have a, a tree workshop coming up also, which is always a great celebration of community building um, while we're learning how to prune trees and, and also plant trees and care for trees. And it's in a setting of an, uh, the oldest uh, Rudolf Steiner School, Waldorf School here in England, with a beautiful walled garden and um, 80, 100 acres of uh, parkland where I developed in 1991 a integrated environmental curriculum for Steiner schools that was partly implemented there at the school. So it's a very interesting historical place to also be partaking in um, first weekend in February. Wow, I want to come to that. Mm. <laughs> 
Yes, please. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, would you like to do that? You know, that grounding. Yeah. To end shall the we, talk? Yeah. Shall we come to a closing with um, the grounding meditation. Yeah. If you'd like to join, Hans is going to lead us in a. Um, just like to say thank you for being here tonight, and it's been a real honor and pleasure to have you all here and listen and share and just be part of this. You know, as Hans said it so beautifully, our our, our vision of our future, you know, and how that could look. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for being present and also holding the space with us here. Um, it's very important that we recognize that even sometimes we feel we don't do anything if we are inwardly holding space. And even if we're going through illness or whatever it might be, there's always a, a bigger reason for being. Um, there's, there's never wasted energy, whatever we are in, in whichever state we're in. Uh, and it's hard to see when we're going through difficulties, but. Uh, rest a piece that you have whatever you do you have a task um, that is you know in front of you and it will uh, further your spiritual and your soul development so blessed be so if you come into a comfortable position and let go of all the concepts and things that you might have been hearing that might have just uh, taken you for a, a space ride um, out into space and back to the earth. So come back into your body and just feel your breath for a moment and your pulse, your heart beating. Be thankful, grateful for being here in this beautiful world, in the wonderful company that we're sharing tonight and wherever you walk and go. Take a few deep breaths. And then I would like to share a meditation that Rudolf Steiner over 100 years ago gave to the farmers. Because the farmers lead a very hard life sometimes, never ending, just like mothers or um, people running a household, never ending. So it's always important to connect with all there is. And it goes as follows. <clears throat> seek the real practical life, but seek it in such a way that the spirit which dwells within it is not deadened for you. Seek the spirit, but seek it not in supersensible greed, not out of supersensible egoism, but seek it so that you can apply it selflessly in practical life in the material world. Apply the ancient words, spirit is never without matter, and matter is never without spirit in such a way that you say to yourselves, we will do all things in the material world in the light of the spirit, and so seek the light of the spirit that it may enkindle warmth for our practical deeds. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Hans. He had a beautiful mind. He had a beautiful mind. It was always that balance. It was always about balance and us finding that middle ground. And the third, in German, we call it the, the third way. Because often we're torn to the extremes one way or another and keeping on that middle path without you know, being dogmatic, just walking a straight line, because that would be very male, wouldn't it? <laughs> you need also to meander and have the width of experience. So bring the, the female experience in. Uh, absolutely. The together, the weaving is going to take us into the most abundant, beautiful, gorgeous Eden 
that's all that's all i see you know I'll, i see it in front of me and if you can do that what you are able to see and imagine it is possible to do it absolutely one million percent <laughs> Woo! <laughs> And if you would like, um, if you got, um, if you got um, this event through Eventbrite, we will be se sending the YouTube video through that as well. Okay. And for people that may have not been able to attend tonight, we can send that also out to you. Lovely. Um, as well. Thank Appreciate you again, it. everyone. And have a good <laughs> evening. It's been lovely to share it with you all. Blessings to you all and. Live life to the full. Enjoy. <laughs>